uh, I wanted to introduce you, if you like, to okay. Professor Fitzgerald. Hi. I, I just spoke Hi, about nice you, so maybe you. I can directly introduce you. Uh, nice to meet you, and congratulations on your breakthrough prize. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I've invited Professor Yang Nagisawa. He's one of the global top uh, sleep experts. And I've invited him to, a, to another different conference series I've, I'm organizing. And I've heard that there are links between uh, sleep and cancer. So I thought maybe there could be some discussion about this afterwards. And if you don't know each other, now you know each other. <laughs> OK, yeah. Yeah, I can easily imagine that you know, sleep disturbance could, you know, increase the risk of cancer through the derangement of immune system. Yeah, indeed, that seems very uh, intuitive. I mm -hmm. think the evidence is rather scant at this point, but I think uh, right. probably have opportunities to start studying that, especially with some of the technologies that mean we can measure sleep so much more directly right. now. Actually, with regard to cancer, the um, clearer evidence epidemiological evidence exists for shift work rather yes, than right. sleep itself it's a Indeed. rhythm disturbance yes. yeah yes yes that's that's very highly associated with for example uh, mammary cancer you know breast mm -hmm. cancer yeah I think we have all the introductions now. Uh, if you want, Rebecca, let's start. Before we start, one thing is, could you tell me if you have a hard stop uh, for your next appointment? You know, how long we can no, go? I, I can be flexible. Okay, great. That's good. Um, the uh, second point is, uh, I just want to ask again, I'm recording this and with your permission, if you permit me, then I'll publish it on, on the YouTube channel and social media and the college might embed it on the college website and so on. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay, great. And of the participants, if somebody doesn't want to be recorded, please switch everything off. Otherwise you'll be <laughs> recorded and published. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's go. Thank Great. You. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Gerard, for the introduction and very nice to meet you all and thank you for taking the time. So I'm going to, to give you somewhat of a broad overview about the advances in detecting cancer earlier and introduce to you a newly launched institute here at the University of Cambridge called the Early Cancer Institute. So I think, you know, cancer obviously is a problem that touches us all um, through ourselves, people we know and so on. And I think the fear from cancer comes from the poor outcomes and also the treatment that often goes along with late stage diagnosis of cancer. So as clinicians, and I am a practicing clinician as well as a researcher, when um, a patient presents with cancer, we um, provide, do imaging and we give it a stage. And um, generally speaking, stage one and two means early disease and stage three and four, when it's starting to escape and invade neighboring structures and become metastatic, we call that stage three and four. And the statistics are really quite stark when we look at five and 10 year outcomes. So this shows the 10 year survival from late stage cancer. This is taking all cancers together and obviously there's a bit of a variation, but the overall survival at 10 years for late stage cancer is about 26% compared with 81% for early stage cancer. These data come from Cancer Research UK, but they are globally relevant. So overall, um, for all comers presenting with cancers, about 50% are diagnosed late stage, and hence, if you do the maths, 10 year survival from cancer, generally speaking, is 54%. Um, the UK government have set an ambitious goal to improve that to 75% of cases um, diagnosed early stage, which would save an additional 55,000 um, lives a year in the UK. But it's not currently clear from the strategy set out by the government and the NHS how we would actually achieve that improvement um, in early stage diagnosis because it's a complex problem. And of course, uh, early diagnosis depends on education, patients presenting themselves, as well as characteristics of the healthcare system and getting patients through the healthcare system rapidly, as well as having the appropriate technologies um, to make those early diagnoses. And the earlier we want to diagnose a cancer, um, the more high resolution and sophisticated our technologies need to become. But I think the time is really ripe because there have been such fantastic developments in the last five or so years in the technologies we have at our disposal. We really can start thinking in serious terms about how we are much more proactive 
in our diagnosis of cancer. Now, before I go into that further, I guess it's worth emphasizing that earlier diagnosis of cancer just isn't just about improving survival. Of course, that's very important. But um, I think we'd all agree we don't just want to live longer and longer. We want to live healthy, high quality lives. And we don't want to be um, submitted to very systemic, toxic chemotherapies that may make us live longer, but um, really with a very impaired quality of life. So one of the key things about earlier diagnosis is that often the treatment is very much more simple. It doesn't require systemic chemotherapy. Often you can just remove the early lesion. And of course, there are substantial health economic benefits to diagnosing a cancer earlier. So what's the scientific rationale for early detection? Is it actually you know, plausible that one could detect cancer earlier? And then quickly one comes into the question scientifically of how long it takes for a cancer to develop and evolve and you know how early we might really want to detect it. So we know that throughout life, um, of course, our tissues are subject to an aging, aging process and DNA replication, um, although we have a lot of um, embedded built-in techno uh, techniques that our cells use to correct errors in DNA replication, it is nevertheless imperfect. Um, and errors do occur in DNA replication throughout life that may accumulate and lead on to develop precursor lesions that can then, if they have a competitive advantage, those cells undergo expansion, what we call clonal sweeps, which at some point may um, lead to a primary cancer or primary tumor, which then starts invading, and that's the invading the, the local tissue, that's the, the definition of cancer, and thereafter it can start to spread as well to other organs. So um, really the holy grail for earlier detection of cancer is to start identifying pre-symptomatic lesions at the precursor stage. So the individual may not be aware, they may not have any symptoms, these lesions are small, um, but of course you can see immediately that this starts to become a complex diagnostic problem because as DNA um, replication is imperfect, the closer we look at our tissues, the more errors we will find um, in the um, DNA code. Um, and so, you know, the, the challenge starts to become to distinguish between normal aging processes and alterations which will stay indolent throughout life and those that are actually genuine precursor lesions that if not, uh, if we don't intervene, they will indeed um, progress and lead to a symptomatic life-threatening cancer. So what we're really trying to do is distinguish from indolent inconsequential alterations in our tissues to those that are potentially life-threatening. Um, and that scientifically is a very uh, interesting and somewhat challenging problem. So I, um, my personal um, area of research is in esophageal cancer which I became interested in very early on in my career because I could see the devastating outcomes for patients diagnosed late. And I was also intrigued by the fact that there was a pre-cancerous um, pre lesion well described called Barrett's esophagus. And actually it's named after a surgeon called Norman Barrett, who it turns out was an undergraduate um, at Trinity College, Cambridge. Um, and he then went on to be a surgeon at St. Thomas's and he was the one in the 1950s that described this pre-cancerous condition called Barrett's esophagus. Um, which is a change, an alteration in the cells of the esophagus in response to exposure to reflux of acid and bile. So it's a sort of an adaptive response of the esophagus to withstand that acid and bile insult, but it can then increase the uh, chances of developing cancer. And it's a very good example of the importance of earlier diagnosis because the majority of patients, and I still chair our multidisciplinary team meeting for the region of East of England, on a weekly basis and the majority of patients we, this we see unfortunately still present with advanced cancer or even metastatic disease. And when they present with advanced cancer, if we think it's curable, which is only the case for about 40% of patients coming through our, our team, then we're talking about chemotherapy, often combined with radiotherapy, um, then followed by esophagectomy, which as you can imagine is a very morbid treatment, um, and then further chemotherapy after that. So a very grueling treatment. And even then, when you've been all through all of that, your five-year net survival is less than 40%.
On the other hand, for patients in whom we diagnose them early with this uh, precursor Barrett's esophagus, if we find alterations, we call it dysplasia and superficial cancer in the Barrett's esophagus, we can treat it endoscopically. And this is an advance that's taken place over the far past 10 years. When I was first practicing medicine, even patients with early disease, we had to proceed to esophagectomy. So if they present with early disease, we can um, intervene as an outpatient through an endoscope. We can uh, conduct microsurgery down the endoscope. And this catheter that's shown in this picture, if you can see my arrow, is um, an ablation radiofrequency catheter, which will then ablate and remove all of the remaining precursor Barrett's esophagus from the patient and the survival, I've given a very conservative estimate here of over 70%, the majority of these patients are cured. So early cancer in the context of, of the esophagus is curable. So um, the question then is how do you go about an, uh, diagnosing it early? We know who the patients are at risk because they are people with a long standing history of heartburn and reflux. And we can generally ascertain that by looking at their drug prescribing history because most of these people are on um, potent anti-acid medication, particularly proton pump inhibitors. Um, so reflux is a risk factor, but you can imagine that endoscoping everyone with reflux would be really quite an undertaking and it's not feasible in the context of population scale screening. Um, while endoscopy is a very good test, it's very straightforward, it would nevertheless be just not logistically feasible or affordable. So what my team set about doing is to develop a non-endoscopic tool, which we call the cytosponge. The idea being that we wanted something you could conduct in an office setting, really simple to do, to collect a cell sample and couple that with um, laboratory testing, with, uh, which I'll go on and explain in a very specific um, way using a specific marker to diagnose the precancerous Barrett's esophagus. So this alternative to endoscopy, the cell collection device, is simply a capsule on, attached to a thread. Within the capsule is a sponge, which is compressed. The capsule is swallowed down and out pops the sponge, which can then be withdrawn, collecting from one to four million cells, which can then be analyzed in the laboratory. And this little video just shows how this works. If I can get this to work. Um, so here's the capsule going down into the stomach. The capsule will dissolve just in that warm, moist environment. Doesn't require acid to, to dissolve. Here's the sponge popping out of that capsule. That's usually administered by a nurse who then withdraws it and it will collect cells from along the length of the esophagus. So this is a very operator independent method. Um, and you'll collect cells that in sort of clumps of cells will come into this mesh. Um, as I say, it's a very rich cell sample. So because it collects cells from the top of the stomach and the whole length of the esophagus, what we then have to do in the laboratory is, is um, work out whether we've got these Barrett cells and precancerous cells in the sample. So to do this, um, we developed a laboratory test, which is a simple antibody test, recognizing a protein which is very specific to Barrett's esophagus called Trefil factor three, and the antibody simply stains these cells dark brown. Because it's a, um, a, a color test, we can use um, artificial intelligence, a convolutional neural network, to identify these areas in an automated fashion so that it can just be signed off by the pathologist. And this makes it amenable to um, you know, scaling up and testing on a population scale. We can also add additional markers to say not only if the Barrett's esophagus is present or not, but whether it's progressing towards cancer. So um, this has been quite a long um, journey. Um, my laboratory has done other things as well, but we set about thinking about this when I started off my group in Cambridge back in the early 2000s. First of all, developing the sampling device. I actually made the first prototype device in the uh, engineering workshop um, at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology. Um, we then developed the immunoassays called TFF3, um, and P53, which is a well-established known assay, we worked out who the at-risk group would be to test. And then we conducted a series of clinical trials to show, first of all, that the first trial called BEST1, <laughs> to show that this would be suitable in an office primary care setting and that individuals would find it acceptable and safe, because obviously if people won't come and have the test, it's a waste of time. The second trial was to look at the accuracy we showed that it was highly sensitive and specific tests, so the false positives are low. Um, at that point, we licensed the technology to Covidian, now Medtronic. 
We then performed a randomized control trial, BEST-3, which was published in The Lancet in 2020, which showed that we could detect 10 times more cases of Barrett's esophagus using this test, cytosponge TFF3, compared to what GPs, GPs ordinary practice, which would be to give medication for the reflux and refer them for endoscopy only if the GP thought that it was necessary. <clears throat> Um, and we continued in parallel to work on the um, assays that we developed and developed the um, artificial intelligence algorithms. In, in, uh, this was in collaboration with um, Professor Florian Markovitz at the CRUKCI, who I'm still collaborating with. Um, and we formed a spin out company to perform the laboratory assays at source. Um, and then COVID came along and endoscopy was really shut down because of the problems with aerosol generation um, as well as capacity issues for endoscopy. And the Scottish government actually phoned me up um, in uh, the sort of early days of the pandemic and said, do you think Cytosponge could help us deal with our endoscopy bottleneck and backlog as we don't really have much access for patients who have symptoms, reflux symptoms, who are waiting for endoscopy and people with Barrett's esophagus who need monitoring. Um, and NHS England then followed suit, and so we um, had to pivot very fast from a research oriented test to a clinical diagnostic test with all the appropriate regulatory approvals and accreditation. Um, and to date, we've uh, delivered over 13,000 tests within the UK um, to help with the COVID recovery. This is in the context of people who are in the system who would otherwise have endoscopy, so we're saving resource for the NHS and delivering a service but what we really set out to do when we developed this technology was in screening and when we went to the national screening committee in the uk with the results of our randomized control trial published in the lancet and said would the uk think about a national screening program for Barrett's esophagus they said that really um, the data was very encouraging with this 10 times increase in diagnosis with the cytosponge but what they would need to see as their gold standard would be a reduction in mortality from esophageal adenocarcinoma. So um, that is what we are setting out to do. We're just in the um, setup phase of the definitive, and I think the final trial, the best four trial. Um, these are my collaborators, Peter Sassini, um, who's designed the trial with me at King's College London, Matthew Di Pietro, who's a clinical colleague. And this is a very large scale trial to show a mortality benefit um, 120,000 individuals be randomized two to one usual care to cytosponge and we will have to follow them up for up to 10 years to see if there's a mortality benefit. So that's where we've got to with my own work in cytosponge as an example but um, let me tell you a little bit more about the Early Cancer Institute which we have set up in the past year and we had our launch event which we were very excited about in September. So here is the, um, the building, the Early Cancer Institute. This is not a new building. This is a building that was built around 20, um, 2001. Um, it has been used for a range of different sorts of research um, over the years, particularly cancer focused, but also in stem cells. Um, but due to reorganization and other new buildings on the campus, this building has become available. Um, and so now we have um, we are repurposing this building and to become the UK's only institute dedicated to early cancer research. Um, and uh, <clears throat> what we're endeavouring to do is to really make an impact into how we um, understand the very earliest processes of a genesis of cancer um, and how we make new tools to detect it. So that this is really a collaborative ecosystem of experts. Um, where we want to carry out transformative research to detect cancer early enough to cure it. And we will have very strong links with the hospital as I'll go on to explain. So I don't know if um, any of you have been to Cambridge and to the biomedical campus in recent years, but it has absolutely exploded and it's now a sort of mini city um, of uh, pharma, biotech, academic research, and of course the hospital. So, um, here is Addenbrooke's Hospital, the 1970s uh, hospital, which um, is still our main clinical facility, but we're quickly, you know, sort of outgrowing this rather um, outdated facility in some ways. Um, and so the, um, there's bold ambition to build a Cambridge Cancer Research Hospital, which has got the go ahead from the government, but it's not yet, um, fundraising is still ongoing. It's not yet uh, started in terms of the building. Um, but this is the aspiration um, and we would link very closely to that. 
um, here is where the Early Cancer Institute is located very close to the old LMB and this is the um, wonderful new um, MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology over here on the left, I hope you can see my cursor. Um, and then of course we have AstraZeneca headquarters re recently um, relocated, um, a new stem cell institute which is very relevant to the sort of work we do, very good ties with the Sanger Institute. Um, and then we are also um, working closely with individuals interested in the cancer problem across university departments. And that's the great thing about being um, in a world-class university so that we can link in with physics, engineering, chemical engineering, and I'll give you some examples of that, mathematics, and also the social sciences, because it's very important we understand um, you know, the public attitude towards cancer and proactive testing so that the work we do can find its way um, into public health. So we think we're very well located and very well networked. We are currently small and, and we're set to recruit and expand. These are our current group leaders. And I'm going to give you a sort of an overview of some of the, of the different sorts of work that's going on at the moment. Which cancers are we working on? Well, we're working on a range of cancers, but we're particularly tackling those with the very poorest outcome. Um, lung, pancreas, esophagus, liver and acute myeloid leukemia. Um, you can see there the number of diagnosed per year and the 10 year fatality. So these are cancers that all have a fatality at 10 years of over 70 percent um, and have been hard to tackle in the early diagnosis space. And that's why we're particularly interested in them. So um, our research uh, sort of framework, if you like, within the Institute is in three main areas. The first is to understand risk prediction, because it's very important when you start proactively testing people that you think carefully about who you test for what, so that you don't actually you know, cause more harm than benefit. And this is where big data, AI and statistics really come to the fore. Secondly, we're interested in tools for detection, working closely across biology, physics, chemistry, and engineering. And of course, there's no point detecting cancer if you can't intervene. So we're also, also working on it, new interception strategies along with our clinicians. For the risk prediction, which I'll cover first, we have uh, very close links with um, the Center for Cancer Genetic Epidemiology, which is headed up by Doug Easton. And one of our affiliate members is Antonis Antonio, um, who's a professor in the um, Center for Cancer Genetic Epidemiology. And he has been conducting over a number of years, large scale epidemiological studies, looking across genetic um, inherited risk factors, reproductive, lifestyle factors. This is particularly for hormonally driven cancers. Um, and his initial inroads have been particularly for breast and ovary cancer. Um, and this has led on to risk stratification tools um, called CanRisk, which have gained regulatory approval for use as a medical device. And so people anywhere around the world, GP or indeed the patient can um, put their data into this CanRisk platform, which will give them a um, sort of a risk prediction which will help um, determine whether they need referral and what kind of testing would be most appropriate. And this is now, these are now very widely used tools. Um, and of course, as more data is put into the tool, then it can be refined um, in an iterative basis. Um, and we have just recruited um, Siddhartha Carl from Bristol, um, who um, came up, he was a, a former PhD student of, of Antonis and Doug and then went to Bristol, he's a cancer epidemiologist, and he wants to take this concept of risk prediction to a multi-cancer um, risk prediction tool. So multi-cancer um, tests are becoming very topical. You may well be familiar with the concept of blood, new blood tests, often called blood biopsies. Um, with there are now um, over 50 companies looking at whether you can test multiple cancers through a single blood test. For example, the Grail um, company who have been uh, launched the gallery test being tested in 150,000 individuals in, in, the, in the NHS. Um, but one big question is, you know, do you test everyone for everything? And what does that lead on to in terms of the downstream tests? And we could talk more about that. Um, and so Siddhartha is really thinking about how we use electronic health records, genomics, um, the large scale diverse global biobanks that we have to think about um, different levels of risk and um, how we then enrich the population to do specific, more specific cancer testing. 
Um, and uh, so he's just starting in the Institute um, in the next couple of months. Um, Serena Nick Zainal is a clinical geneticist and she's particularly interested in mutational mechanisms and insights that we can gain from our DNA fingerprints. So this is looking across the whole genome of an individual and in terms in thousands of individuals to look for patterns in the DNA without getting too concerned about which particular genes that's affecting necessarily, but the overall patterns um, in those DNA mutations. So this is now possible through the large scale sequencing that's going on and the big data from millions of NHS records that she can access. Um, so in a recent study, which was published last year in Science, she showed that there are 58 mutational signatures or patterns which hadn't been appreciated before. And through these patterns, you can also start to look at the, some of the causes of cancer because you can start to spot um, common uh, patterns um, related to specific exposures, might be UV light, for example, um, smoking signatures and unknown signatures. So she found some new signatures that point perhaps to new causes of cancers that haven't been appreciated before. And then she takes these into experimental systems to try and prove cause and effect. And of course, the ultimate aim would be to use these to detect cancer earlier and find the causes or the potential Achilles heel in an individual cancer. This is um, Jamie Blundell, and um, he is a physicist by background. He trained at the, at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. He then went to Stanford University for a while, and we managed to recruit him back. Um, and he is using um, evolutionary biology um, and computational methods to really look at the archeological record of blood samples to predict um, leukemia diagnosis. He started with leukemia that the, the principles he's using are very relevant across many cancer types. He started with leukemia because it's much easier, of course, to have access to blood samples than tissue samples. Um, they're just much more common. And he actually turned to a, a huge um, study, which was in fact used for um, ovarian cancer research, but because of the scale and um, the longitudinal follow-up of that biobank, he was able to look and see if any of those patients had developed um, acute myeloid leukemia and then compare the um, patterns of DNA mutation. These are acquired mutations in the blood of these individuals over many years for those that did get yeah, AML and those that didn't. And he was able to identify specific mutations in specific genes, which gradually um, increase over time. Some are irrelevant, like this little orange one down here, but some that really track with the development um, of the leukemia, and he can work out the competition going on between these different clones and these different mutations to see what's causing the cancer. Um, so it gives insights into the mechanism, but also then how you might go about um, detecting it years before the patient actually um, has symptoms that they're aware of. Turning to um, liver cancer, Matt Hoare is a hepatologist, so a clinician scientist who's recently joined the Institute. And um, chronic liver disease, as I'm sure many of you will be aware, is, is, a, is a, you know, an increasing problem. And it's also, as well as being chronic liver disease being a problem in its own right due to the effects it has on liver function, it's also a risk for liver cancer development. So liver disease is actually the third leading cause of premature death in the UK and it includes chronic alcohol, viral hepatitis, and of course, fatty liver, which is becoming much more of a problem with obesity. So um, Matt has been working with the Sanger Center and he's identified six genes that are mutated in patients with liver disease. Um, and that's these understanding this particular set of genes gives um, a deeper understanding to the role that these genes play. And interestingly, these mutations reduce the sensitivity of the liver cells to insulin. So you can see the connection here with fatty liver disease. Um, and if these mutations are acquired during a person's life, it can impair the liver's ability to respond to dietary sugars and fats. So he's working more on this to understand the mechanism and see if this could help um, uh, be an indicator of people at risk for liver cancer. So those are some... Um, examples of groups in the Institute working on risk prediction. Um, let's turn now to detection. So um, 
Daniel Munoz Espin came to us from Spain um, and he has an MRC and a CRUK program looking at cellular senescence. So this is quite a hot topic in cancer biology because ordinarily cells divide and replicate. Um, and if the cells are damaged because they're exposed to factors like tobacco or alcohol, for example, the normal machinery of the cell should recognize the damaged cells and then prevent them from dying, uh, dividing and make them senesce. But if it doesn't kill the cell, they just sort of sit there, they're senescent, but they haven't actually died, then these cells uh, can potentially actually be harmful. And there's increasing evidence that senescent cells can have very potent tumor promoting um, activity. And we can measure this through what we call the SASP factors. So Daniel and his team have been working with Robert Rintoul, who's a clinician. He's a reader in thoracic oncology, he works at Papworth in defining precancerous lesions in the lung. And they found that the cell environment, which is if it's enriched in these senescent SASP factors and the macrophages in the immune system, then that can promote um, lung cancer onset. And of course, many of these sort of uh, mechanisms are true across several different cancers. It's not just true in the lung. And there's nice crossover here because the work in the liver that Matt's doing, he's also showing that senescence is a very important um, paradigm in cancer in the, in the liver. And how can we turn this to our advantage? So this is a very nice collaboration with Liliana Fruk, who's a reader in bio nano uh, engineering um, in the University of Cambridge. And um, it turns out that if you can um, image the senescent cells then you potentially have a new detection tool. So they've developed a new probe and this is a polymeric senescence probe that you can see it through fluorescent dyes, which are um, attached to it and they have photoacoustic tomography um, properties. So this um, photoacoustic tomography me me method um, is very good because it combines high spatial resolution of the acoustic imaging <clears throat> with the excellent sensitivity of the optical imaging and it gives you very deep tissue penetrance up to 10 centimeters. And they think that this tool could be powerful for longitudinal monitoring of senescence, both as a detection tool and during therapy. Liquid biopsy I've already alluded to, um, and many companies are working on this. Uh, the current um, methodologies for liquid biopsy are um, super exciting. They're all predicated on factors shed into the blood from tumors. Um, these can be mutated DNA, they can be proteins. Um, and one of the big challenges at the moment is whether you can get these um, secreted factors in the blood, whether they're sensitive enough to detect early stage cancer. So I think it's very clear that these methods, these blood biopsies can detect advanced stage cancer, can be very useful in monitoring response to therapy. But the question is, can you really detect cancers that are going to make a difference in terms of the outcome because they're detected early enough? And Charlie Massey has been working in the Institute together with Grant Stewart, who's a professor of biological oncology here, to um, use very sensitive methylation assays across thousands of markers to really improve the sensitivity um, of this type of um, blood uh, biopsy. And this is, of course, could be applied to any kind of cancer. He's particularly applied it so far to prostate cancer, where the real challenge there is distinguishing between um, a normal aging process, going back to the beginning of the talk, compared to a prostate cancer, which is actually going to be life limiting. Um, and so far, the data is very um, encouraging from Charlie when applied to large data sets um, of blood from patients with prostate cancer to show that this methylation DNA assay can distinguish between metastatic and um, non-metastatic potential prostate cancer. Um, and a, a final word on interception um, with one example here. This is um, Harvey Dev, who's a clinical lecturer in neurology. He's a bit earlier in his career, but he's partnering with AstraZeneca, um, again, in the context of prostate cancer. And he's using um, patient-derived models. We call them organoid models because these grow in 3D as little spheres in a dish. And this is a relatively new technology, which was really pioneered by Hans Klevers in the Netherlands. Um, and it enables us to, to grow 
very representative, these 3D cultures to the human tissue so that you can do um, experiments to try and understand um, mechanisms and also responses to, to therapy. So um, he's been, he's a surgeon, so he's been taking surgical samples and developing these effective 3D models um, to the, the, the models that recapitulate indolent prostate cancer and more aggressive prostate cancer. And then using those models to study the mechanisms underlying DNA damage um, using genetic modifiers, and then taking these insights into clinical trials, working together with AstraZeneca um, to look at novel therapies and repurposing existing therapies. So um, we're a very translational institute with a you know, really vision to translate our findings and have a path to impact. We um, currently have a clinical facility in, um, in the hospital. It's called the Clinical Research Facility. So it's in um, the current Addenbrooke's Hospital. Um, in due course, that would move to the Cancer Research Hospital um, if and when that um, is built. Um, and so part of our culture is to be entrepreneurial and to partner with industry um, and to spin out the technology as appropriate as well. And Jamie Blundell, who I talked to you about the work on acute myeloid leukemia, he's also um, spun out a company called Synteny Biotechnology just at the very early stage. But his idea there is that we can actually use the power of our, our own immune system to um, tell us whether the body is sensing a cancer. Um, so um, this is a new venture, but I think um, a very clever idea. Um, another example of technology which is being translated um, is uh, work collaboratively with Sarah Bondik, who's a professor in the Cavendish lab. Um, and she's interested in novel imaging technologies, um, particularly um, in the context of endoscopy. So the example here um, is to adapt um, a endoscope with, um, to enable you to do multispectral imaging. So um, this schematic shows that a baby scope, as we call it, is introduced into the accessory channel, so down the side of a standard endoscope, and light is passed in from the source and reflected from the tissue. And it's the spectral distortions introduced by interaction of the light with the tissue that are measured outside of the patient using a spectrometer. And um, this uh, graph here gives you an idea of the spectra collected from, this was 715 spectra from 15 patients, showing how you can separate out the healthy squamous tissue down here in the purple from the precancerous and the cancerous tissue looking down the endoscope. And this is exciting because very early cancerous areas can be very subtle and hard to see, even with high resolution endoscopy. Um, so finally, just to finish, um, we're working as part of an international alliance set up by CIUK, um, which gives fantastic training opportunities um, to recruit individuals and PhD students and postdocs who can move between these institutions and also enables us to do larger scale studies between them. So this is an alliance between Canary Centre at Stanford, Cambridge, the Knight Institute in Oregon, UCL and Manchester. And one of the things that we've done in Cambridge is to set up a, a cohort um, because one of the real uh, sort of obstacles to research in this area is having um, access to big data sets from patients who are healthy before they get their cancer um, with longitudinal data. So we started this about a year ago. We've recruited um, over 100 patients so far. We've already got 3,000 sample aliquots from those patients. So it's a sort of exponential growth um, cohort, which I think will be very valuable down the line. We're collecting health and lifestyle question, um, questionnaire data. Um, we're interested in collecting physiological measurements from these patients as well. We could collect sleep data, for example, um, and collecting samples from blood, urine, and so on. And this will be a shared resource available to other collaborators. And ultimately, we hope that um, our path to impact will be through the Cambridge Cancer Research Hospital um, in due course. So um, I hope that gives you a bit of a whistle-stop tour and an overview of the kind of exciting work going on in the Early Cancer Institute, which is very much a partnership between the NHS, the CIUK Cambridge Centre scientists, um, the wider university policy makers. We've very, got some very nice interactions with policy think tank, both in Cambridge um, and public policy makers, um, and of course, funding from charity, government and 
philanthropy. Thank you very much for listening and very happy to um, answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for this fantastic overview on on uh, really really important work. I mean, I hope uh, I hope I didn't have cancer, but my father had cancer, so you know, as, I mean, you know much better than us uh, that uh, uh, it affects everybody, all families. Yeah, indeed. And also, you don't. Nobody wants to have cancer, so to know. Uh, you mentioned some causes of cancer, alcohol, and uh, there are many others, I guess. And your work also, of course, has impact on 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 this uh, this lifestyle improvements to uh, mm -hmm. reduce the risks. So right. that's really really important. It's very very impressive. Uh, I have prepared two little uh, well two questions. One is I was very impressed. I saw mentioned when I was reading up on on, on some of your work. I saw you mentioned also work. Uh, on breath analysis, which is a bit parallel to your sponge technique, which you didn't uh, mention in your talk now. Maybe you can uh, talk about that because that's also very, very interesting as a kind of cost efficient uh, population, uh, you know, broad population testing. Yeah. So, you, I mean, you're absolutely right that we need efficient, easy, accessible methods for broad population testing. So that's why there's a huge amount of interest in, you know, body fluids like urine, blood breath um, for the esophagus if we know who's at risk actually you know and it's pretty easy to get a sample from the esophagus so my thinking there is you know it's it's it's, it's why not go to the source because you, you your signal is much um much higher um, but the volatile work is a collaboration with Alstone Medical that's also a spin out from the University of Cambridge from um, Billy Boyle who's um spun it out from the Department of Engineering actually interested in defense um sniffing bombs and so on is in the first uh, iteration um but his wife died tragically very young of colon cancer and he decided to also turn his efforts to thinking about whether volatiles could be used to detect cancer early um and through um metabolism um you know we then excrete volatiles in the breath um not so this doesn't have to be just from a local cancer from lung for example you know you can potentially detect changes in the breath um from metabolites come through the liver from other tissue organs as well. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so that's the concept behind breath biopsy. And we've been running with Billy a um, study called the PAN trial, um, seeing if we can detect multiple cancers on the breath. Um, I think it's fair to say some cancers are easier to detect than others. Um, it's very sensitive to um, factors in the environment as well. So if you turn the heating on and the radiators or paint the wall, then that will of course also change the characteristics of the volatiles you measure. So actually he's now doing much more work um, on evoked probes where you actually eat something or, or drink something. Oh. Um, that's then, you know, so you can then use the substrate and the changes in metabolism expected from that substrate. Um, um, and you know, you choose your substrate obviously um, um, but you don't have to have drunk it many uh, many hours beforehand. And that seems to really correct for a lot of the um, background types of signals. So I think that's quite exciting. So um, so they're pushing hard on that technology. Well, that uh, sounds very interesting. The other question I wanted to ask you is, I think you mentioned it uh, 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 in your talk also, is the DNA and epigenetics uh, causes, uh, not causes, but like roots or paths to cancer. And I, we had a previous talk by uh, Shankar Subramaniam, who's, uh, of course, who's uh, developed or invented uh, the, the next generation DNA. And also he's looking now with his new company on, on, on uh, the epigenetics uh, work. Indeed. So and he's looking now at quadruplexes as well. And I'm, I'm looking, I'm working with Shankar on that. So oh, I you think do? Yeah, that's what I was uh, yeah. wanted to ask, yeah. because that is kind of obvious for you yes. to work with. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, some, some of, some of these changes may give you insights into the root cause and other times you can use these things as markers, even if they're not actually necessarily, you know, there's a big debate sometimes about whether it's necessary to have cause and effect for something to be a good biomarker. And sometimes it can be, you know, it, it may be, uh, um, just a correlative signal, but if that signal is very, um, strong that can still be very useful um so you know there are many ways in which our dna is regulated of course 
um, not just the sequence. The sequence is one layer, the hard core, but there's a lot wrapped around that that yeah. enables the cell to, um, you know, decide what, what DNA to transcribe. Yeah. Um, so uh, there are multiple levels in which we can then assay this. And of course, the, the more, you know, if we don't, I think, the DNA code is, is one way of doing it, but the more we can layer onto that, actually the more potentially sensitive and specific some of our readouts can come, become for these, for these assays. And methylation does turn out to be really quite a sensitive, um, so an epigenetic mark, really quite sensitive tool for measuring changes in the blood. And one of the other things about epigenetic changes is they seem to be, they, they kind of, um, they give you an archaeological signal which is preserved, which, which continues to tell you about the cell of origin. And so it gives you a kind of look into the past um, in a way that the, the base change in the DNA doesn't necessarily. So um, potentially with these blood tests, if you find a mutation that tells you you've got cancer, the other important thing is where did it come from? Because if you do a blood test which tells you you might have a cancer, then you've got to decide what test to do next. Mm -hmm. So are you going to do a whole body scan and try and find it? Or, or could the signal in the blood also give you an inkling that actually this is more likely to come from the colon, say, or the lung, so that you, you know, have a good idea where to look? And that specificity seems to be easier to get from the epigenetic type mm -hmm. marks because they, they, are, they, they hold that um, historic information about where, where the tissue of origin is, is from. So... Um, very complementary, all these techniques, I think. Uh, if there are, maybe we can ask others to, uh, if, who has questions here? Of, uh... I, I, I have one, yes, which, I mean, you touched on this briefly, but I know in the past there have been screening programs being stopped because there's too much, you know, overdiagnosis, over, over treatment, either, you know, false positives or, you know, they would have been cancers that wouldn't have progressed and therefore you cause a lot of you know concern for the patient unnecessarily yeah. is that is that a data problem i mean is that a data analysis problem that will will improve as we go along or, or do you have any particular tools to overcome that problem yeah so i think this is this is one of the big challenges in the whole field and this is what you know can give it the bad press from you know prostate cancer is the classic example thyroid is another one actually in japan um so um it's very important to um, tackle this and um, there isn't one simple way of doing it. So you need to think about your, this is why the risk profile is important. Because if you know the rarer the cancer is in the population, if you're testing for that, then, then the more difficult it's gonna be. And you, you, know, you don't have to do the simple maths that you know, even if your test is 98% specific, it's a very, if it's a very rare, cancer type you're still going to throw off too many false positives um, so you think have to think about enriching and prop, so properly profiling the, the population and there you need certainly need big data sets um, and the more parameters in those big data sets you can you can include then the better you'll be able to enrich the population and then your tool um, needs to be very good <laughs> And it may be that you, by using um, several different orthogonal measures on your fluid, say, that will also help build in the, the confidence and the robustness to your assay so that you can really be specific as possible. And then the other important factors to consider are very you know, practical ones about how invasive is the test and the follow on test. And if you find something, is it, you know, can you do something about it? Can you do something about it in a way that um, you know is straightforward, or is it going to cause you know a lot more harm and therefore maybe difficult to justify? So, for example, you know if I find something and I think someone's got something in the esophagus, having a quick look isn't really a big deal. And even if the lesion turned out to be indolent, removing it down an endoscopy is is really not also a very big deal. And this, you know, anything has complications, but they're pretty unusual and pretty easy to sort out. If I find a signal which suggests a pancreatic cancer, that's a much more difficult organ to deal with. And the only real measure we have currently is the only therapy is, is surgery and or chemotherapy. And if I'm going to start removing a pancreatic lesion and operating, you want to be 
pretty sure right now that it's the right, you know, that you have got the right diagnosis and you're doing it for a good reason. I got, I had a very interesting debate with someone earlier in the week, actually, um, in government about, well, if you can't do anything about it now, does that mean you shouldn't look for it? Or do we need to still be looking for it? Because down the line, we would be able to do something in any way you've got a right to know. So that becomes quite an interesting <laughs> debate. Um, but, um, but I think it is very, very important. And it's in, so, you know, another discussion is, well, now we've got these um, blood tests like the Grail Gallery test, you know, at what point do we roll that out to everybody? So this, this gets, uh, you know, you get into the, the policy, the affordability, um, the public benefit versus harms and so on. Um, and that is why in the UK, we have a very high bar with our national screening committee. And that's why they've said to me, for example, for cytosponge, sponge, even though we've got quite strong evidence and a pretty simple test, you know, they really want to understand fully the benefit um, profile and whether this would reduce mortality before they roll something out on a widespread population scale to exactly avoid this sort of problem. Um, it's a big area. <laughs> That's um, it is very, very important. And I yeah, think you can't, you know, you can't get away from it in this field. You you have to tackle it head on and think about it early on. It's no good just being very, you know, making more and more high resolution, very, very sensitive tests that are just gonna, if they're not very also very specific. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh thank you, Anna. If let's have a look if um uh, yeah, I think that's right. Actually, yes, actually. Uh, nice talk, Professor Fitzgerald. Thank you so much. Uh, I just had a quick question. So, uh, where do you see the fields like telemedicine or smartphone-based detection play mm -hmm. a role in this uh, this yeah. area of cancer <clears throat> That's a very good question. So, we're just thinking about how we might build in um, to our cohort that we're developing um you know collecting real-time data on changes in symptoms lifestyle um, and through sensor technology for example um, and one of the challenges with diagnostics in general um, and early cancer in particular is you know you have to you have to wait for the either either you go and ask someone to come for a test that they may or may not decide to take you up on or you have to wait for them to come and see the doctor because they've got a symptom <laughs> and and compliance is a big issue. Um, and, you know, often the people who are most vulnerable, actually, you, it's, it's too difficult. They've got so many other worries as well. They, they you know, they're not going to come and seek your attention. So you have to make things really, really easy. So thinking about how you, pro, you know, how you incentivize people, how you would give them an alert, um, how you can test at home, make it very convenient, all these things become very important. So so I think it is very um, interesting to think about how you can use smartphones to be collecting data that could um, help us look after ourselves and give you a nudge and the appropriate incentives to go and see somebody. Um, how you do that in a way that is really um, appropriate, um, feasible, ethical and so on it gets um gets more challenging but i think you know we do have the power to collect a lot of data about ourselves and our environment so i think it's a fascinating area it's something i think we should be getting into more in our institute and through collaboration thank you thank you so much okay uh, can i ask yes please but wondering whether whether the the data which is uh, collected oh, in dealing with Sorry. individuals yeah. is, is made use of in some way, yeah, or is it all just binned? Yeah, sorry, I follow now. Um, so um, it depends which healthcare system you're in, but um, so you know, these data are all stored and depending on the permission can be shared and used for research. So um, in the in the NHS and in many hospitals on the consent form, and including on the endoscopy consent form, it'll ask you to tick a box to say whether you're willing for your data and samples to be used that's left over. Um, and increasingly there's a move to try and make that pretty routine so that it's always, you know, almost becomes an opt out. 
scenario. Um, but there's a lot of data that could be used that still currently isn't used. And the access, actually, when you start to come your, to, to, to do your study is quite arduous, particularly in the UK system. So actually, at the moment, we've had a study going for a long time, and I want to update the survival data. And the hoops we're being put through by the Office of National Statistics are absolutely, you know, very, very arduous and long-winded, um, even though patients have consented in our study. So it's quite, you know, this, these things, I think there's a lot we should be doing to um, educate the public and to make data sharing um, more widespread and easier for the researchers to then access, because that absolutely is our key to making progress. And it's also a huge asset um, that certainly we have in the National Health Service that um, industry would be very, you know, it's a commercial commodity as well that could be, when used properly and ethically in good hands, could make great advances and also be economically very valuable. So I think it's, yeah, absolutely. The data is lodged there and it should be used, it probably isn't used as much as it should be. And I hope they didn't lose your results and that it's all fine. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's all right, actually, but um, sounds yeah. like it is. Uh, I'll, I'll delete that from the recording, your personal is issues. <laughs> yes. I, I'm not bothered. I have absolutely, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> but still probably we should delete them. <laughs> I, I'll delete it from, <laughs> right. from the recording. Can, can I ask another question? Because <laughs> what is the funding for all this? Um, activity in, in, in this area. Um, is any of it public funding or, or is it all private, just coming from various companies, presumably motivated for, for reasons of profit eventually? There's a whole range. Um, so, you know, in the Institute, we get funding from Cancer Research UK, from um, Medical Research Council and NIHR, which is government. Um, we don't get... Um, much industry um, sponsorship, um, but of course, then we do, you know, generate IP and spin out that IP, um, and then philanthropy as well. Um, funding is, you know, it's a tough climate right now for for funding research for research, as I'm sure you're all probably aware. And um, cancer has been somewhat protected, but nevertheless. Um, it's very fierce for young people wanting to get into a career um, in cancer research once they get sort of beyond the postdoc level, wanting to be um, form a group and so on. It's highly competitive. Um, commercially, this has become a much more uh, hot topic. I mean, in the past, it was diagnostics have always been a bit of a Cinderella in cancer compared to therapy and all the effort traditionally has gone on late cancer therapies. But I think there's now a real appreciation that the prize is around, you know, we can make real inroads if we can crack the early diagnosis um, better. And this has suddenly become of much greater interest, plus the technology's jumped as well. So now we can do things which were just, you know, inconceivable <laughs> 10 years ago. So suddenly there's a lot of commercial interest, which um, is, is a good thing. Isn't that a bit also a philosophical question of how people are motivated? Because if the health system is organized to reward, uh, you know, high profits on on uh, very expensive treatments, uh, yeah. then also it depends how the insurance systems are organized and how the payments are organized. And different Indeed. countries have, have extremely different systems here. I mean, US system is totally different than Japan or UK or Germany. So yes, that would lead to different uh, outcomes, I guess. Absolutely. Um, we, we could have a long discussion about that. Ah, yeah, well, <laughs> that's <laughs> I mean, another time. Yeah. And I think um, most people working in this area have have some, you know, very good motives uh, mm. because it's a problem they want to help solve. But the other other side of it, you know, for these things to be successful, um, they have to be commercialized and it has to be a you know a business proposition which will last so um and uh yeah yeah i'm i'm working with a uk one of the things i'm doing now is working with a uk also cambridge related regenerative medicine self-therapy 
uh, company developing therapies for immune system. And they are also, we, uh, when I, I'm working also on their funding round. So I'm talking with pharma companies and mm. the commercialization is a very, the profitability uh, and how you can make money with it is a key factor for them to yeah. be interested or not. Indeed. That's the world in which we're in. So I think you can't ignore it. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you so very much for this fantastic event and, and all these very deep thoughts and, and fantastic research results you, you gave an overview of and uh, we'll all uh, uh, benefit from uh, having our cancer risks reduced and earlier uh, found out if, if we do have some indication of cancer. So that's very, very important work. And thank you so much for doing this and explaining to us. It's a pleasure. Uh, really appreciate thank your you interest and opportunity and hope it was understandable and enjoyable. Thank you if very you much. Manage, if you manage to come to Japan, please come and uh, we'll have a dinner with you, a dinner event. We have... Uh, I started the Zoom discussions with uh, in 2020 with the virus situation. And before that, and also in, in parallel now, we have about once a month, we have a Trinity dinner here in Tokyo. So if you come to Japan, please uh, join the dinner or tell me before and I'll arrange a dinner to suit your schedule. Thank you. It'd be lovely to take you up on that. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.